Horner from Maine. We're delighted to have uh, uh, Matt Siegel, and I'll let uh, Jamie, who I thank for making this uh, match, to introduce uh, Matt. Thank you for coming, Matt. Thanks. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Matt. So um, Matt got his MD at Stanford, and did his training at Brown. He's an associate professor at Tufts, and he's the director of the Development Disorders Program at Maine Behavioral Health. He um, he's he's got good grants, but the thing that's most striking is he's got these cool awards, awards that most of us have never won, like a forty uh, under forty award, and even better, he was pronounced one of fifty bold visionaries of Maine, which, I mean, I would have retired right I'm there. I'm but I'm not in Maine. So, um, I'm bold. But so, the, I invited Matt here, so Matt and I were sitting on a bus, we were on a bus, coming, I forget where, but we were on a bus, and we were talking about the work that he's doing, and as you'll hear, you know, when I say, oh, I work with autism, people say, oh, that's such hard work, and I think, well, no, you know, we, we see them, and we do research, but we're not in the trenches, and Matt's work defines the trenches. So he really sees the most challenging, uh, most difficult, um, most non-responsive treatment kids that there are. And I, I thought it'd be really appropriate for him to come talk to us is because we're a place that has a fantastic child and patient service and a strong autism clinic, and really he's putting those two kinds of things together. So I thought this is really fertile kind of ground for learning for us. So Matt. Be bold, Matt. <laughs> I have bald covered. So we'll see about bald. Yeah. Um, so can you hear me okay yes. in the yes. back? Okay. Sometimes I fade in the middle of the talk, so just signal, signal me if I start to fade. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Martin, Dr. McPartland, for having me. Um, yes, it was on a bus, uh, one of those Simons Foundation buses where... We're all being shoveled around New York City and wind and dine. Um, and uh, so it's great to be here. Uh, I was telling them I haven't been here since I interviewed for medical school 20 something years ago. And uh, this is a much more pleasant experience than that was. Um, and the food Just is. Just you wait. <laughs> and the food is better now. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to tell you some about uh, what we do, both clinically and some of the research we've been doing. Um, and it's a mix of both, and that's what my life is, is a mix of both of those things. Um, and focusing on this really weird uh, but interesting, and it turns out productive, world of inpatient treatment of folks primarily with autism and or other developmental disabilities. <coughs> So uh, quick disclosures, I work for Maine Behavioral Healthcare, which is the behavioral healthcare arm of Maine Medical Center. Uh, have done some consulting on this topic uh, for various entities. Uh, have, some, have research funding from NIMH and two foundations, and then also started a summer camp for high-functioning kids with autism up in Maine. Um, and so, by the way, a great thing about living in Maine is to be one of the 50 bold visionaries of Maine. There's only about a million people who live in Maine, <laughs> and so that isn't that high a bar. Really. Um, so it's it's okay. Um, it'd be much better, you know, down here. Uh, so anyway, um, so these are our learning objectives. Talk about trends for inpatient care, some of the common challenges, and some of the best practices that we've identified. So something I think that is not very well appreciated um, is kids with uh, autism particularly actually have very high rates of psychiatric hospitalization in the US. Um, so uh, David Mandel did a survey of parents some years ago and asked them, um, has your child ever been psychiatrically hospitalized? Among other things that he asked, and 11% said yes. That, of course, is a small portion of the population, but that is uh, a much higher number than you would get in other surveys of neurotypical youth. Um, I think just for reference, one survey I saw of uh, commercially insured uh, neurotypical youth, it was 0.23% had been psychiatrically hospitalized. So uh, that's one look at it. Uh, a better or a, a more systematic look at it is Lisa Crowen from Kaiser Permanente large closed model HMO system in 
primarily California, the West Coast, so they have excellent data, excellent capture for epidemiologic type studies. Um, looked at 33,000 kids, and she found that uh, ratio was 6.6 to 1 for psychiatric admissions for kids with autism versus non-autism. So that's a, you know, a, a marked difference. Uh, so, not surprisingly, like other chronic conditions, um, there's a small portion of the autism spectrum that consumes most of the healthcare dollars spent on autism, and so this is from uh, Lisa Crowen's study as well, that 10% uh, of the kids accounted for 53% of the costs. The interesting thing to me was if you want to get to that cost in those kids, um, it, those are the kids who are being psychiatrically hospitalized. And so um, if you're interested, whatever angle you're coming from, cost, quality, or people who need help, this psychiatrically hospitalized subpopulation of folks with autism is a place to go. So the other very interesting thing to me is, is that as high as those rates are or ratios are for psychiatric hospitalization, in many parts of the country, it is actually incredibly difficult to psychiatrically hospitalize a person with autism, as you may know, um, particularly if they are nonverbal or have intellectual disability. So um, why is this? Uh, no one knows, but here's my speculation, and there are many reasons, but some of the reasons that come to mind for me is stigma, right? Um, so, uh, and one of the ways stigma, I think, plays out for the autism uh, population is that in many states you can't have a psychiatric hospitalization for autism or for effects of autism. You have to have a co-occurring mm -hmm. disorder because somehow autism isn't a psychiatric disorder in the DSM. I think it is, but apparently it's not according to those insurance companies and so you have to have anxiety or depression or something else. So, so that's my kind of jaundiced view of that. Um, and I think that that's very problematic. And so then people go through this kind of charade of, of giving them or trying to find another diagnosis so that they can be hospitalized. Um, that's not true in all, all states, but in, in many. Um, the, another issue is the chronic problem of diagnostic overshadowing, which is um, when you attribute the features and things you're seeing to uh, one diagnosis, but they, you're letting that overshadow what another diagnosis that may be present. So there may well be anxiety, depression, psychosis, other things, but you're simply just attributing it all to autism or intellectual disability. Um, I, then I think we have to recognize that there can be resistance by the clinician or the institution to admitting these kids um, because they are very they can be very challenging, but also, you know, child psychiatric units are led typically by child psychiatrists, possibly child psychologists, and if you haven't had exposure and training with this population, you're not going to feel comfortable admitting them and treating them in your inpatient unit. And uh, this was a study from a couple years ago um, that showed that most child psychiatry trainees see less than five outpatients, less than 10 inpatients in their two-year fellowship who have autism or intellectual disability, either one in total. So on average, a relatively small exposure. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that on the institutional resistance or, or challenge part, um, I don't find that surprising because the model typically of an inpatient unit really doesn't match. It's a mismatch to what this population I think typically needs. And that I'm gonna go into some detail on now. So why is it a mismatch often? Uh, not that you know certain units do a great job, but just on average in general, why, would it, why is it a mismatch? Well, the first thing is, is this population has different needs. Um, so here's a, a look at that. Um, so, you know, what, what is common, what are the common elements of psychiatric units, particularly child, child adolescent psychiatric units? So, um, generally, they were at least initially developed for internalizing emotional psychiatric disorders, uh, people experiencing those. They still very much, um, and appropriately so, rely on verbally mediated interventions, talking with staff, discussing events, having family meetings, processing, um, which all means talking, basically. Uh, they rely on group programming, typically groups run by social work, psychiatrists, etc. cetera. Um, they often have very frequent transitions and changing schedules. And in terms of behavioral reinforcement, they tend to rely on 
you know, kind of level systems, things that are program wide. So you can be a level one or two or three, and that depends on your behavior. And then in terms of reinforcement, it's typically delivered on perhaps a daily or a weekly schedule. So not a very dense reinforcement schedule. And they tend to be reinforcers that are kind of adult oriented or hospital oriented, like having privileges. So you can go to the cafeteria or something like that. Um, all of which I think often makes very good sense for a typical child adolescent yet. However, when we look at the other column at kids with autism plus minus intellectual disability or just intellectual disability, um, we really have a different set of needs or presenting problems. So as I'll show you, um, this population is primarily presenting with externalizing behavioral symptoms. They may or may not have a comorbid or co-occurring psychiatric disorder, um, but they're typically presenting with externalizing behaviors. Um, and these days, so are a good number of these kids, but this is the primary presentation over here. Um, by definition, many have difficulty, or not by definition, but many have difficulty with self-report. They may struggle with verbally mediated interventions or even get agitated. Um, the social, the group programming that goes on is a pretty high level of social demand. And so just in the group nature of it. And so uh, that may not work for this population. Um, being in the hospital, they're removed from their typical routines and caregivers, um, which is disorienting potentially. And then I think very salient is they are used to typically a much higher frequency or density of reinforcement and also much more specific. So could really care less if they get to eat in the cafeteria, a child may be, but is totally motivated by getting to see, you know, the same five minute clip of their favorite video. Um, but the idea of having a video player on a unit that that could, could watch, you know, sometimes really doesn't work from the institutional perspective. So sometimes, not always, but sometimes what this leads to then is, you know, kids get agitated, they're excluded from the programming, they're not being reinforced at a density they need, they're in their room, they get aggressive, and then it leads to other problems. So it certainly doesn't happen all the time, but it happens with uh, some frequency. So that's really, and again, not to, I'm not trying to be critical, but rather to say, well, it was set up for one thing, and this is something different mm -hmm. frequently. And so that's, and I, from my perspective, that makes sense that that's a mismatch. So here's a look at the different problems. So primarily presenting with uh, externalizing problem behaviors. Um, so this was a look at what was the chief complaint uh, for the admission. So of course, many kids have one or more of these. They all have one, they, they have, have multiple. Um, but it was what was the leading or chief complaint. So aggression, self-injurious behavior, uh, sexualized behavior, tantrums, property destruction, um, a few with kind of decreased functioning uh, or elopement. So primarily fairly you know, serious problem, external, externalizing problem behaviors. Um, and just to, for reference, when we say self-injurious behavior, this is primarily uh, not, this is not um, what you see on adolescent, neurotypical adolescent unit, which is um, non-suicidal self-injury, cutting behavior, et cetera. This is hitting oneself, biting oneself, the self-injury that you might typically associate with uh, autism or more severe forms of autism. Uh, yeah, are you mainly talking about a group that's fairly low functioning here? Um, so, no, actually, I'm talking about the group that is admitted. This survey, and thank you for asking, was the group that's being admitted to specialized child psychiatry units that only admit folks with developmental disorders, which I'm going to tell you more about. So this includes high-functioning kids. Um, and yes, you know, sometimes suicidality or homicidality will be the presenting problem. Um, but even the high-functioning kids are often presenting with these externalizing problem behaviors because even the high-functioning kid who's, who's with autism, whose real issue is their social communication deficits, their inability to flex and you know, understand what people are asking, have you know, difficulties with theory of mind, perspective taking, what happens with them is they do fine, they do fine, they do fine, and then they blow up. And then they start either saying things that are dramatically problematic like, uh, you know, I'm going to blow up the school or I'm going to kill all of you, whether they have intent or not, you know, is a different question and usually they don't, but they know it gets a big response or they do 
you know, engage a high function person in aggression or property destruction, etc. So they're often presenting with these things. Um, but I'll tell you more about this population in a minute. Um, so uh, this is just another look at the different problems. So this, this maybe is a, a, another way to answer your question. So this was not a specialized unit. This is David Mandel again from uh, CHOP, and he was looking at a large, I think it was a Medicaid uh, database, so very large database, <coughs> looking at um, what were the uh, reasons for hospitalization, and, and he was looking at psychiatric hospitalization and autism. So it was uh, aggression, 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 meaning physical aggression, not, not verbal aggression. That doesn't get you hospitalized. Um, he found some demographic associations, single parent homes, um, couple psychiatric comorbidities, and then self-injurious behavior. Um, and not surprisingly, that the risk for psychiatric hospitalization increases as kids get older. <coughs> so this is all comers, including high, low functioning. And my guess is primarily actually more oriented toward the higher functioning. Sorry. So um, just to talk a little bit about some of the reasons or things that might lead people to psychiatric hospitalization. So obviously, psychiatric comorbidity. Um, so here's a couple broad statistics, youth with ID. So both the ID and autism population appear to have significantly higher rates of psychiatric comorbidity than the neurotypical population. Um, so youth with ID, this, this look, uh, about 40% with any DSM-4 disorder. Um, youth with autism, it appears may be higher than youth with ID. Uh, and this look had 71% um, with the DSM-4 disorder. Here's a more detailed look. Uh, this was an interesting study. So this was a group um, out of, uh, I think, Boston University. And what they did is they took the case ads, you know, a well-established uh, diagnostic instrument, a uh, psychiatric diagnostic instrument, and they modified it to try to make it speak autism, essentially, by, based on their experience. They did it through a consensus process, um, and I think they, they did a, a, a pretty good job. And then they ran 109 kids who had at least some spoken language, so <coughs> sort of middle to higher functioning group of kids with autism through it, and this is what they found. Um, so it was primarily, or most commonly, anxiety disorders, and you can see the breakdown, including specific phobias, which accounted for a lot of what they found, followed by ADHD, followed by mood, uh, and then relatively rare, uh, more serious mental illness, um, bipolar, and they didn't happen to find anyone with psychosis in this, in this sample of 109 kids. So this is certainly far from perfect, but I think it was a really a strong effort to try to take a hard look at psychiatric comorbidity in this group of kids. And I think that this fits well with what the work that's been done since then, including work Coming, coming from this institution, that anxiety is prevalent and diagnosable, um, and now there's starting to be you know, more work on atypical anxiety, different forms of anxiety and autism, followed by ADHD, and then mood. So another um, contributor, I think, to these behavioral problems and psychiatric hospitalization is the emerging concept of difficulties with emotion regulation in autism. Um, so, uh, and Carla Mazewski is a collaborator of mine, and Susan White, uh, or I collaborate with them, I'm a collaborator of theirs actually, uh, um, have done some great work in this area and are really building out this area. Um, and so this is their slide, this is uh, Carla's slide actually. Um, so, emo things that in their view contribute to emotion dysregulation in mm -hmm. autism are this array of things, including you know, poor problem solving and, and difficulties with abstract reasoning um, and a number of other pieces there. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we see a lot, whether the child is high or low functioning, this difficulty with regulating their emotions, you know, not, you know, it's obvious that the self-report can often be difficult, but well before we get to reporting on how we're feeling, there's, you know, these other factors, I think. <clears throat> and, of course, there are, can be medical contributors to the development of problem behaviors. Um, hmm, I don't know what happened uh, there, but 
we'll just we'll just that's some kind of symbol for poop in poop out or something. <laughs> uh, so, um, so you know, uh, well, I was going to say this when I got there, but I'll just say it now. So, if you work on an inpatient unit with kids with developmental disabilities, you get you have a lot of, you know really smart people on your team, and you have these incredible discussions about the etiology of behaviors and overlap of psychiatric comorbidity, et cetera. But, and that's all true, but then the reality is, is we spend like 80% of our time talking about poop and how we're gonna manage the mm -hmm. poop. So, yeah. and whether, yeah. yeah, and what emerges is, not the best term, but what emerges <laughs> is that um, when we have put all our energy into a kid and, and they're still not doing well and we can't figure it out, then we start blaming it on constipation because that's kind of the good, that's your kind of final, you know, pathway. So anyway, that was a joke. Um, so as you know, seizures um, uh, occur in about 20% is what's reported of kids with autism um, with a couple peaks, GI problems of various uh, uh, ilk, um, the most common being constipation and encoparesis, which is definitely prevalent, as I said, GERD, allergies, and then all the other things that happen to kids also happen, of course, in autism. Um, and so this is something that I try to, you know, pay a lot of attention to when kids are coming through and also teaching the residents and fellows that they will, you can read a lot of articles about exotic ideas about exotic medical problems in autism and fungal, you know, this and that in your GI system, but just, you know, we need to look for what we know is common and occurs and drives a lot of problem behaviors. And this is, I think, a pretty good list. We just had a kid who had an occult dental abscess, which is like, you know, your, your famous sort of case study for what might be driving a problem behavior. Unfortunately, you only find that once in a while, and that, that's fixable. Um, so that was kind of a broad look at psychiatric hospitalization of this population and who's coming in. Um, now I'm going to tell you about um, specialized psychiatric units, including the one I run. Um, and so this is a map of most of them right now in uh, the U.S. As you may know, there's the a nascent one that I need to add to the list um, here in Connecticut um, at the Hospital for Special or Sick Children. Special, um, special care. Special, special care. care. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, so I need to add that to the list. Um, and they just got going recently, I think, um, and have a few beds. So this is the rest of the map, if you will. And there's several states that seems to be an emerging uh, uh, level of care, and hopefully we've contributed to this a little bit um, with some of our work. Uh, there's at least four other states I'm aware of who are working on this, or hospitals. And just to say, these are all child adolescent units. Adult units are extremely rare. There's one in Pittsburgh, there's one in Iowa, and there may be a couple others, but extremely rare. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with one in um, New Hampshire. Which one is that? Yeah, that's at um, a hospital called Hampstead Hospital. It's a for-profit uh, entity, um, and they have a unit. Yeah, There's nothing in Boston, which I like to point out. Um, so kids from Massachusetts come up to our unit occasionally, or they go down to Bradley Hospital in Rhode Island, which is brown. So we know a little bit about, about these units. Um, so we did a survey a few years ago and surveyed nine of them at that point. Um, and so this was the information we got then. Average length of stay was about 30 days. Um, and I learned a couple interesting things from my perspective, which is these units were very independent of each other. Of course, there were a few clinicians who had moved across them, but had grown up pretty independently, but they all had the same basic model. And it's a different model than the model that's on typical child adolescent units, which is, it was really a true biobehavioral model, meaning that, you know, we did psychiatry, medication, therapy for the higher functioning, family support, et cetera, but they were also running um, behavioral modification programs based on applied behavioral analysis, some more, you know, in depth, some less in depth, but all of them defining target behaviors, taking data, um, and having behavioral plans. And so that, um, you know, you don't often, you don't typically see a behavior analyst on most inpatient units. And so they all have one or a behavioral psychologist. Um, and they, therefore, they all had very large multidisciplinary teams. 
Uh, we did a follow-up survey uh, that we did not publish where we looked at 11 of the units, learned a few other things, um, that these were primarily, these are primarily functioning as autism units, so they'll admit any child with a developmental disability, but three quarters of the population is autism and one quarter is everyone else. Um, average length of stay at, in that look was 22 days. I wouldn't view that as a change over those two years. It was just, it was a slightly different mix of units. Um, and fairly low readmission rate or recidivism rate um, of about 14% in one year. So I'll tell you about our program a little bit. Um, so we have a, so we have a developmental disorders program in Portland, Maine. Um, and it consists, it started with a inpatient unit. So we started with the highest level of care in, in mental health and we had nothing else. Um, and so then we built out the, the rest of it. Um, so we have an inpatient, this specialized inpatient unit that I'll tell you about. And we have a school <coughs> that only serves these inpatients. So it's, we, we call it the most selective school in Northern New England because you can only attend it if you're hospitalized in the most intensive treatment unit in Northern New England. Um, you can only attend it for like 30 days. Um, but we called it Spring Harbor Academy because we thought that these kids should kind of go to a fancy private school name too. So we, we, we thought that was fun. Um, we then have a day treatment program or you could call it partial hospital program. Um, we have a multidisciplinary outpatient clinic uh, and then we have our research program. So our unit is 12 beds. It's a locked, self-contained unit. Um, it's one of eight units in a freestanding psychiatric hospital. That's a 100-bed hospital. Uh, take kids four to 20 years old, and basically, you either have autism or intellectual disability. That's kind of the entry criteria, and you need hospital level of care. Our average length of stay is 38 days, um, which is a little higher than some of the other units. Um, and of course, like all units, we have a few stuck kids. So most kids are moving through in 20 to 30 days, and then a few get stuck and pull that average up. Um, and as I mentioned, we define target behaviors, track them continuously, graph them, and review them daily at our treatment team meetings. That is the kind of core focus of our team meetings. So, you know, in order to do a treatment program, we had to look at, well, why are kids coming here? Um, and, and so this is an example, this isn't the, a definitive list, but just we thought, well, um, so what's the causality chain? Why do kids end up hospitalized in our unit? And so at first we have a kid with a developmental disorder, which pretty much means by definition, they have some impairment, some level of impairment in their emotion regulation communication abilities. Um, then, these are options. So they may not have a functional communication system, which we see frequently uh, in Maine. Um, they may have providers who don't, don't have much training in the population. This can lead to other issues, communication frustration, family dysfunction. Um, we might miss or overdiagnose, underdiagnose comorbid mental illness, um, other issues. And so what we see is um, kids the kids who get admitted to us, while the insurance companies typically would like to hear the story that the kid was doing great, was doing fine, and then suddenly they're doing terribly and it's an acute crisis and they need acute hospitalization, the reality is, is when we look back and we talk to the families, they're usually in really a chronic crisis state, um, that the families are just surviving with them and the child's trying to survive. And then finally, something happens, you know, they hit the wrong person or the SIB just gets so intense and then it's called an acute crisis and then they get hospitalized and that's good. But if you, the reason I, I do the, you know, do this and, and we kind of pay attention to this is because if we treat it like it's just an acute crisis and the problem is just whatever happened in the four days or seven days before the admission, then we really won't accomplish anything because what's really going on is all of this. Now, in an inpatient stay, of course, you, like everywhere else, there's limited, I mean, we have nice resources, but they're still limited. Time is limited. So you can't do kitchen sink and try to address all these things. The hard part is picking out the few key factors that you think are driving things that might actually be modifiable during an inpatient stay. And that's really the crux of our work. Um, so our philosophy in doing this work is that you can pick out the key acute and chronic factors that are driving crisis. 
um, and address them in an inpatient stay. Uh, that positive reinforcement helps kids give up behaviors that have been working for them. As maladaptive as they may seem, they're working for the child and it's a risk to give them up and learn new ones. Um, and that if we're serious about ferreting out psychiatric comorbidity, that will also improve outcomes and reduce polypharmacy. That's our philosophy or hypotheses. Um, so we have a large multidisciplinary team for this inpatient unit, including a couple folks you don't typically see, like behavioral analysts, board certified behavior analysts, full-time speech pathologist for this inpatient unit, full-time occupational therapist, and the rest of the team. Sorry, keep going the wrong way. Um, I'm gonna skip that. So the foundation of our treatment is a couple items. So a highly individualized behavioral plan, um, and we embed in the plan, I really love how our behavioral specialists do this day, and basically whatever it, we figure out works for the child, that goes in the behavior plan. So we don't kind of call it, oh, it's an OT intervention, so it needs to happen over here, or it's a communication intervention. It all goes in, and it's all used to manipulate antecedents and determine the reactive procedures. Targeted psychopharmacology, and then we have a big focus on transferring the skills and what we learn to everybody else. Because again, it really doesn't matter if they look good in the hospital. It's nice and we feel good about it, but we don't feel that good when they go home and things are just the same. So we have to try to transfer things out of the hospital, which is of course a major challenge, but we take it seriously. Um, so that's the core of our treatment, and then I would say depending on what the child is presenting with, or the family is presenting with, then we will add additional components. And so these are, this is not an inclusive list, but some of the, these are some of the additional components that we might add. So if it's a high functioning kid with autism, like we were talking about, and the issue is really their social cognitive deficits, then we will try to work with them on specific strategies to address you know, what is getting them into trouble or causing them to explode. If the issue is really you know, paralyzing anxiety, then we're gonna do some adapted CBT protocols to try to address that. And here are other examples. We did, we've had a, a number of cases where we adapted TFCBT down to some kids who are kind of middle language functioning, a lot of echolalia and scripting, but you know, not intellectually disabled and had some very good results with them. Would you mind saying, I'm not familiar with circles and five. Uh, yeah, so those are those are two uh, programs, circles and five is against the law. So circles was developed for the intellectual disability population, I think quite a while ago. And it's a very concrete representation of boundaries. So it's for kids or adults who, you know, cross boundaries, they may, you know, hug a stranger or do things that are more problematic. And so it's literally, who's in your purple circle, mom and dad, who's in your orange circle, uh, you know, your aunt and uncle, et cetera, who's in the brown circle, your teacher, and so, and then you lay it out on the floor and you step through the circles. And so the nice thing about our stay is because we have them for 20, 30 days, if that's the program we're doing with the kid, then that language is running all day long. It's part of their behavior plan. So when they cross a boundary or do an inappropriate behavior, the response is, Oh, John's in your brown circle. Remember, we, you know, so we shake hands with that circle. We don't, you know, hug or grab at things or whatever. So that's what circles is. And then five is against the law is another uh, curriculum which basically rates. So five is like gets gets the police, and four gets something a little below that. So it's just another concrete way to kind of because you know there's that problem of like you know, we're doing things and we understand that it's driven by uh, social communication deficits and other deficits. However, they're gonna get arrested. And so we need to explain that to some of the kids. And fortunately, some of the kids really don't like the police. And so you can kind of use that to your advantage. Some are fascinated by the police and then that's a, you know, take a different approach, but that's what that is. Can I ask a quick question? What's TFCBT? Trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, strong, strong evidence base. However, has not, no, no publications, I think, actually, last time I looked a year ago, on adapting it for <coughs> this population uh, or for autism or intellectual disability badly needs to be done. If there was a million years in my life, I would definitely do it, but don't have time. So we just start doing it clinically and kind of moving on and using it. But badly needs to be done. 
So if any of you psychologists out there wants a career, like that's a that's a great trajectory, and there's a lot of I, there has been a lot of funding in TFCBT. Um, so something else. So as I said, we're trying to transfer skills, and we take that seriously. And so, and we have this nice length of stay. You know, it's not six days, and so we can work. I think get a lot done. And so we have a family behavioral training program. That's what we call it. And um, what has evolved over the last 10 years with this, as I've been there, is at first, you know, it wasn't called anything. And it was basically kind of, oh, will you please come in and see what we're doing? And wouldn't that be nice to like, over the last 10 years, we've just gotten more and more demanding and more and more prescriptive or proscriptive. And, and that works much better. So, because we take it super seriously, I mean, this is our prescription. It's as serious as the risperidone. And so we need to give it, in fact, it's, it's more serious and it's definitely more complicated. And so, and it probably has, you know, broader effects. And so we take it very seriously. So when the families come in, we say, this is what we're doing. We do didactic sessions with them, understand the diagnosis, do some work on contingency management, talk about the behavioral plan. And then far more important, I think, is then the in vivo training. So we have them come in and shadow the staff, meaning they're watching what's happening, staff are explaining how they're managing their kid, and then we flip it and the parents or the caregivers run the behavior plan and the staff step back. And this is like for hours, this isn't for five minutes. I mean, it might start with five minutes. So it's in vivo learning model and that's really the best way to learn, of course. And so um, that is a lot of work, as it sounds like, but that's what we do. And of course, we get a spectrum of participation from families. Um, but what we have found is the more serious and demanding we are, you know, at first we were just very nice and we weren't getting much response. And so that has been fairly effective for us. And the nice thing is, is we also have schools coming in. We have, if grandma's a big caregiver, we try to get grandma to come in. We have in-home staff coming in. So we're trying to get everybody on the same page and moving in the same direction. The other key part, of course, with parents coming in is we're getting feedback from them on like, I could never do this at home. Or like, you know, you have me doing this, but like my kitchen is here and, you know, this very real world stuff. and. So then we will start adjusting and weaning the plan to fit their environment as much as we can. How many days do the caregivers come in typically? So we really demand that they come for three sessions. Um, many come for more. And we'll basically give them as much as they'll come in for, pretty much. There are a few people who we saturate and say, you know, you need to come a little less. But <laughs> um, we kind of have a three-step thing. And that's the minimum that we ask for or demand. Um, so what does this produce? Um, so this is a, a one look at that. So we, this is not a controlled study, so this would be, um, we, just, we just took all the kids who were admitted and we looked, did an ABCI, the ABC, Aberrant Behavior Checklist Irritability Subscale with the same parent or caregiver at admission, discharge, and then two month follow up. So home for two months. And uh, so not surprisingly, they're coming in as a 45 point scale above 14 or 16 is usually considered clinically significant. This is a scale that measures aggression, self injurious behavior and tantrums. Um, and that's why kids get admitted to us. So it's a perfect outcome measure for us. Um, I mean, those are really the three reasons they come in. Um, so this is fairly high 26, 27, 28 um, at admission. This is a very nice drop um, down to about 12 or so. Um, but the part, and so we were thinking, we were hoping that it might look like this um, because we're obviously throwing a lot of resources and energy uh, at this. So hopefully they look better when they leave. The part we had no idea about um, was what, what happened after, you know, we get reports back, but, and of course the kids who don't do well, we might see again. But it turns out that they're doing pretty well two months out. And we, you know, it's only two months, and obviously there's a little bit of regression here. Um, it, it wasn't statistically significant in this look, but obviously the question is what happens going further out? So we are starting to look at nine month data. But even this, and even if they continue, if this continues and they regress, we feel pretty good about this because this is a population coming in 
who has been typically very refractory to treatment. So they're already on multiple meds. They've already been through day treatment programs. They've already in a specialized school. They already have in-home support services. They already have a behavioral plan, is most of the population that we're seeing at our site. And so they're, yeah, I think it's very fair to say they're treatment refractory. Like these kids are not going to be settled down by, you know, moving their risperidone dose around. They've already been through all of that. What's the sample size of the two? This was, yeah, I, I didn't explain. So the reason there's two lines is because we, we did the kids with autism and the kids with intellectual disability, not autism. Um, and this is because we had this perception of ourselves that we did a better job with the autism group. So we thought that the lines would separate uh, and they, they didn't. So the, both groups are doing this, the same uh, through the setting and the sample size, I think this was 38 kids total. So small group, no <coughs> control group. <coughs> but we just tried to get some sense of what was going on. About equal in both groups? But the, the end was yes, about it was 19, yeah, yeah, I believe it was 19 and 19, yeah. yes. Okay, I have to accelerate a little bit here. Um, so I think what I'm gonna do is skip this case example. I'll just show you a nice graph of that patient's aggression. Um, I'll come back to it if we have time, but we're, no, we're not gonna have time. So um, let me tell you a little bit about, so that's what we do in this inpatient treatment unit. Um, what we then sort of had the insight is, is that a lot of the kids, as you're seeing coming through, we thought, well, wow, we have a population that's really understudied, which is folks who are more severely affected by autism, <coughs> is what I would say. And so um, this is a real opportunity and we've got, uh, some nice flow. We've got a lot of volume coming through. So what can we do about that? So we formed a research collaborative, worked with some of the funding organizations, and developed um, uh, something to try to start to help um, with this challenge of heterogeneity in autism. Um, so you know, a few questions that we thought we could contribute to were: How do we get to more meaningful subgroups within autism? Which is, of course, a grand uh, goal, but we just hope we can contribute. Um, and then there are a lot of questions you can ask about across severity, um, and so this is one of them. And really the question we were, I was worried about, and we were worried about, is our, our, our large collections, so the Simon Simplex collection, other collections of data, how representative are they of the full autism spectrum? Um, because the Simplex collection is incredibly important uh, in, and uh, uh, has produced you know, well over 100 papers, but it was an out, not but, and it was an outpatient study, 12 clinics, multiple clinic visits, so it skewed high in terms of the severity of autism, because our kids definitely could not go through that study. Um, and so we thought we had a unique opportunity to build a sort of parallel collection of data and, and samples and sequencing for this other end of the spectrum. And so the short of it is, given the time, I'll just say the short of it is, is we had some funders who agreed with us. So we set up what came to be known as the Autism Inpatient Collection. Um, and that's still running. It's a five-year project. We're at about three and a half years now. Um, and so we've enrolled 800 programs so far and their parents, if, if the parents are available. Our goal is 1,500. Um, and what it is is essentially a fairly rigorous assessment battery and then bio samples and then we're on the road to getting those samples sequenced. And then all of that will go up in uh, uh, a database for approved investigators through the Simons Foundation. So some interesting things about this group. Um, so this is autism only, uh, ADOS research reliable um, examiners, so de determining autism or not, um, based on a lot of inpatient observation and then the ADOS. Um, almost 50% of the group is minimally verbal, meaning an ADOS module one or two. 42% with intellectual disability, and this is using the LIDAR-3, which is a nonverbal IQ test, very uh, conservative, I would say, like very general, gives, I think it gives the kids the best chance to score that they can, and, you know, and we'll do multiple sessions to get them through it, and still 42% with intellectual disability. Um, and then the mean global adaptive functioning on the violin is a 57, which is fairly low. 
So, and as I said, the goal is to make this data available to all approved investigators. So I won't go through, this is our protocol, which we published uh, a year ago or so in molecular autism. Um, so a few other things about our sample. So the mean age is about 13, um, typical about 80% males. And this is the ethnic and racial breakdown. So one thing I think worth just pointing out is um, just comparing a, a quick comparison with the Simon Simplex collection. Uh, so that was that outpatient collection. Those, that, skew, that, that group was younger on average. The nonverbal IQ there was 87, and we're running about 75 on average, and that's with the lighter three. Um, this is the Vineland, uh, 74 to 57. Um, so those are some of the comparison statistics. And that was for the males. Here's the females. Forty-eight percent with ADOS module one or two. This is something that I think you know I'm very excited about because this group of minimally verbal or nonverbal kids um, is really understudied, and we don't have large samples of them available. So by the time if this, I mean, there's no reason we don't think this will hold. So forty-eight percent. If we get about fifteen hundred kids, we're going to have a you know a database of seven hundred and fifty kids who are non or minimally verbal with you know measures and sequencing on them. So that will be a very nice resource, I think. Sorry. And then uh, just quickly on behavior, this is the aberrant behavior checklist, irritability subscale and admissions. So in this six site study, the same, it is actually basically the same score as my one site study from a couple years ago. Self-injurious behavior present in 22% of the sample. So also an opportunity to study that population. Um, and this is another self-injury measure. Uh, so that we have time for questions, I'm going to skip through this. Uh, just We looked at some risk factors. We have a bunch of manuscripts under review that hopefully will come out sometime this spring or summer, um, or they're in the final stages of review. Um, so we looked at risk factors for hospitalization, took a look at suicidality, um, use of psychotropics, behavior and verbal ability. Um, we also looked at what are the behavioral outcomes for these six different units. Um, and so this figure probably, so this looks similar to my one site study, right, from a couple of years ago. Um, these are the six different units. So they all have that basic look of improvement and then a little bit of regression, but these curves are not the same, certainly. They all start out in roughly the same area of problem behavior, or severity of behavior, but there's some significant differences here. And so we've started to look at this. The one thing that's popping out is that length of stay seems to be associated with less improvement and durability in the improvement. So if your stay is too short, then there's something about that, and we don't know what that is. We can speculate, but uh, we don't know what that is. Uh, and I will just skip this. We've done a couple other things to try to improve care. Um, so I'll just summarize and say, um, kids with autism or intellectual disability can develop and do develop serious emotional or behavioral problems. And that puts them at risk for a whole bunch of things, including polypharmacy, psychiatric hospitalization, residential placement. Um, psychiatric hospitalization is common. I talked a lot about specialized units. Of course, most kids are not hospitalized in these 10 or 12 specialized units, but rather in typical child adolescent units. Um, we have found that the specialized units, when we banded together, have been a very productive place to collect data and, and study this population, particularly the more severely affected. Um, I would say there's emerging evidence for what we're doing. I didn't kind of give you a detailed look at it or get to go through that case example, but. Um, I have a couple of references for you. And uh, we don't understand this yet, but it looks like length of stay might be related to some of the site differences we're seeing in these specialized units. So uh, lots of, I work with lots of people, uh, and I presented a lot of work by other people um, and tried to note that, uh, but really wonderful folks. And we have some of our funders are here. Um, here's a couple resources, and I'm happy to email this to anybody as well. Um, so 
we published this group, this research network, published a consensus best practices in JCAP uh, about a year ago on inpatient treatment of youth with autism or intellectual disability. And this was kind of distilling recommendations that we thought possibly could be done in any inpatient unit pending resources and commitment and time to try to improve care. Um, so this is not how to run a specialized unit, but rather what you could possibly transfer to a different, you know, more general setting. Um, this is an article that we did just about in specialized inpatient treatment, if you're interested. And then I thought I'd just mention as a general resource, um, ACAP just published uh, this nice parent medication guide for kids with autism and has uh, a lot of nice resources in there and it's free and it's on the ACAP website. So if you're, it, I just thought I would mention that because it's a, I think a useful tool. So thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. So Matt, this is awesome and so impressive. I'm asking a question, I hope it's not a depressing question. But you, you know, you've got research, and you've got your clinical going on. To what extent does a very impressive clinical operation depend upon the research? Is this kind of specialized model something that is a clinically viable model? Or can you get insurance companies oh. to be supporting speech and language pathologists and occupational oh. therapists on units? Is this okay? So that's a great question. So the the question was: Is is the model that we're running the study in or on? Um, viable, you know, can you get it paid for? Uh, and the answer is yes. The, these, all of these units were operating before this study and will, will be operating once it ends. Um, so, you know, it's very, so most of these kids have Medicaid and it's, that is completely state by state dependent in terms of what the reimbursement rate is and what they cover. However, almost all of these inpatient units have or the, the institutions that house them have negotiated a an enhanced reimbursement rate to run this kind of specialty unit not all of them but most have and that's necessary because i didn't get into the details of not just as the clinical team have additional people but the real cost is of course we have a much higher staffing ratio in terms of our direct care staff to these kids who are being admitted with a developmental disability plus aggression self-injury and other issues so um, so it is, it is viable. In fact, uh, actually, my, my unit is one of the economic drivers for the whole psych hospital, actually, believe it or not. Um, so, so that, and, and when I took the job, that was, I noted that and thought, okay, this would be a good place to work um, uh, because we're valued in that way. Um, and then the research has really been an addition for these settings and has been, um, I think, very good in terms of you know, fomenting kind of intellectual curiosity, et cetera. And also, I think it has improved the quality because just once you have people start looking hard at what they're doing, of course, then you, know, you start asking, why are we doing it? And all of those kind of things. Um, so it is, it is viable. Um, yeah. Um, in the beginning, when you had your pie chart of presenting problems off, um, you mentioned briefly threats. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if those are a significant component of what you see and how you kind of assess and manage that sort of situation. Sure. Um, so it's, it's not, for these specialized <coughs> units, that's not typically what's getting them in the hospital. It's not, it's not enough um, to get them hospitalized. However, lots of these kids, the verbal ones, do make threats. You know, I'm going to blow up the school or I'm going to kill myself, those kind of things. And... Uh, I don't think there's a quick answer to that. I think the approach is either, you know, it's, it's either or a mix of trying to address what are the social cognitive errors, deficits there. Like, do we realize what we're saying? Do we know what it means and what it makes other people think and then what happens? Or it's a, you take a and or a more behavioral approach of, you know, here's the consequences of that happening or here's what, what you're gonna do or access if you don't say those things. Um, but it's it's often based on misunderstanding or social, you know, or attention seeking. And if it's a ten, that's an important distinction, obviously, because if it's attention seeking, we're going to take a very different tack because we don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it and supply all kinds of attention to it. So that's a quick answer, um, but it's definitely an issue. Um, I'm just curious. 
Do you guys um, handle children who are not native English speakers or their families are non English speaking? We do. We do. Less of an issue in Maine, um, but, uh, <laughs> but no, we do. And several of these units, you know, one is in Baltimore, uh, 